Welcome to the Dry Dock episode 26, everybody. And just a short bit of housekeeping this time. Um, it seems that the sticky comment on the last Dry Dock for the competition has somehow reached its max. I don't know. Um, YouTube shenanigans. Um, but anyway, uh, if, if you can't reply to it, just reply in the general comment section and I'll somehow collate it all at the end. Um, and on that note, I'm going to say that the competition is going to close on the 31st of January um, at midnight, so as it goes into 1st of February. And I will make the appropriate draws, selection and notifications on the, uh, the first weekend in February. So hopefully everyone will be fine with that. And as per the previous competition, um, if you prefer to keep be an anonymous winner, which everybody in the last competition did, then of course I won't publicise your name. Um, but if you want to let everyone know about your good fortune, then of course I will facilitate that as well. So, with that said, let's get on with some of these questions, shall we? Angry Gamer asks, would an anti-aircraft battleship be feasible like the Atlantas were for cruisers, and do you think it would have outlasted normal battleships? Feasible? Yeah, sure. Um, practical? I don't think so. Um, you'll notice the picture that's up there at the moment. This is a USS Wyoming. She is, or was, a 12-inch gun dreadnought of the US Navy converted later on to uh, an anti-aircraft training school and as you can see all, where her twin 12 inch barbettes and turrets were the barbettes are still there but they've stuck a 5 inch 38 caliber turret um, one of the twin ones that so beloved of uh, many US battleships cruisers and destroyers and uh, you might notice it takes up a surprising amount of space um, given that that barbette originally held a pair of 12-inch uh, long guns. So, effectively, the problem with trying to build an AA battleship is that surface area only increases as a square of length, whereas volume increases by cube of length. So you end up building an awful lot more ship without vastly increasing the surface area, on which is, of course, where you can mount the guns. So you can already work out roughly what the maximum density of uh, heavy AA guns on the side of the ship would be uh, from things like the Iowas or the Montana designs. And then where you've got the turrets on the front and back, kind of as you can see, there's not a tremendous amount of room left. I mean, if you, uh, if you, I suppose if you didn't install the barbettes of a battleship at all, you could probably get a run of turrets kind of like the Atlanta, maybe uh, sort of mix and match Japanese four turret and Atlanta three turret stacks. So you might be able to, I guess, I get four turrets on the front and four at the back. And with five on the side, you'd have a lot of anti-aircraft firepower, admittedly. I mean, you'd be looking at, what, uh, about 13, maybe 14 or 15 um, 5 inch 38 twin turrets um, it, per side, um, per broadside, so 30 guns, which would be a tremendous long range anti aircraft battery, but you could just build two Atlantas and you'd get pretty much the same thing um, near enough. And I can guarantee you two Atlantas will cost you a hell of a lot less than an Iowa hull covered in 5 inch 38s. Um, so yeah, I don't think it's a, a practical idea, but it would cer could certainly be done. Um, who knows, maybe the, the US, actually no, it, there's no point in doing triple or quadruple 5 inch 38s because that will cut down on the rate of fire, which is kind of the point of anti-aircraft guns, but there you go. Um, however, if someone had been mad enough to do it, then it might well have outlasted normal battleships, ironically enough, because... Stripping out 5-inch 38 turrets is remarkably easy compared to stripping out triple 16-inch 50s. And so you might actually have just about had an economical, economically viable candidate for conversion into a guided missile battleship, which then might well have lasted a lot longer. So yeah, hope that, uh, hope that helps. Sar Jim asks... 
With the more recent ship-to-ship -ship question, what combination of US surface ships would be needed to defeat the Russian battlecruiser Kirov? I'm going to assume you're looking for sort of a minimum viable product, as it were, because of the obvious answer is a carrier battle group. Um, although, obviously, Kirov was designed to sink that kind of thing, but I'm pretty sure a full nuclear carrier strike package could probably overwhelm Kirov, albeit that it does have a fairly significant uh, anti-aircraft defence of its own. Of course, all the Kirov class have been renamed since they were originally launched, but they keep changing the flipping names, so let's just call it the Kirov, because everyone knows what we're talking about then. But essentially speaking, and yeah, obviously make sure you don't get in gun range, you've got to defeat its main anti-shipping uh, salvo, which is going to be 20 granite missiles. Obviously the granite being a fairly fast supersonic uh, anti-shipping missile, and one with nearly a ton of explosive on board, plus the, obviously the body of the missile itself and any remaining fuel. So you really can't afford to get hit by even a single missile, it's not like you're just going to shrug it off. Um, pretty much any surface combatant that eats a granite is a dead surface combatant, with the possible exception of a like a Nimitz-class carrier if it gets lucky. So, to be safe, but still retain this kind of minimum viable product type uh, arrangement, I would probably say you want... I'd say to be safe, take three Burke class destroyers and a couple of littoral combat ships. And the, the tactics I would use would then be you'd send the two littoral combat ships out with whatever aerial uh, scouting capability you can get onto them. Um, you'd send those out in the direction you vaguely know the Kirov to be in. And the scouts plus the ships themselves are effectively your forward eyes and ears to tell you when the granite salvo is incoming. And yeah, they're not going to be able to defend themselves, but let's face it, um, who really cares? Um, well, I mean, the crews, obviously, you don't want to lose them, but LCS is LCS. Granite bait is probably the best purpose for them, to be honest, in my opinion. Um that should anyway that should give you enough warning and with three burks you should have the rate of fire to be able to down the 20 granites and if you miss one um and of the ones that hasn't expended itself on the uh, lcs's then well that's why you have three ships um once you've defeated that salvo you can then close in i wouldn't put any stock on um using just the uh, anti-shipping missile complement on the uh, on the Burks themselves. Harpoons just aren't going to cut it against a ship like Kirov with as dense an anti-missile defense as it has. However, um, as some of you will know, and others of you will be uh, pleased, dash delighted, dash thrilled to know, a great number of the standard missiles that the Burks carry can be used in an anti-shipping role. So if you have two or three Burks still left, and hopefully, because you've taken two or three, well, you've got two or three left, you should still have quite a number of standard missiles left, you can just volley fire standard missiles at the Kirov, along with uh, any harpoons you might have on board, and Kirov is going to run out of surface-to-air missiles before you run out of surface-to-air missiles, which then means it's going to die death by a thousand cuts. And uh, yeah, so I think that's the best way to defeat a Kirov um, comfortably whilst not going completely overboard. The Budgie Admiral says, uh, was it considered to convert the Montana design into an aircraft carrier, much like was suggested for some of the Iowa class? And how do you think a converted Montana would have fared if she'd been built instead of the Midway? Now, I'm not aware of any plans to convert the Montanas into aircraft carriers, at least nothing serious. Um, slightly strangely, for the slower of the two classes, the Montana is actually slightly longer than an Iowa, um, although it is slower, as I said, being a 28 knot design as opposed to uh, Iowa's 33-ish knots. But it's still shorter than the Midway with a similar beam. So 
I think the main problem with the Montana conversion is the power plant. Now, obviously, yes, it might get a bit more uh, speed out of the fact you can ditch all the uh, heavy armor, the turrets, and the superstructure and all that. Um, but then you do have to add on the hangar deck and the flight deck and the island. Um, and historically, conversions of capital ships have always been less efficient than uh, pure build carriers for obvious reasons. I mean, uh, if you look at the capabilities of uh, Yorktown class, like the Enterprise versus the capabilities of a Lexington class, and then compare the size and displacement disparity between the two, you can see that the Yorktowns were running a lot more efficiently as aircraft carriers than the Lexingtons were, albeit that the Lexingtons were just so much bigger. Um, so compared to a Midway, which would be bigger than the Montana in the first place, albeit not by too much, the Midway is always going to outperform a Montana conversion. The main problem a Montana conversion is going to have is, as I say, going to be that restricted power plant, which is going to pull its speed down. Um, you'd have to reinforce uh, the power plant to get it up to speed, and obviously, then effectively you might as well just build a Midway. Jay Lozier says, uh, how did the treaty limits affect the torpedo defense systems and general survivability of cruisers and carriers uh, against torpedoes? U.S. treaty cruisers seem to sink if you so much as waved a torpedo at them. It seems as if all navies made compromises to save weight that put ships at more risk from torpedoes than they would have liked. Now, there was some allowance in the treaties to improve torpedo protection on legacy ships that were coming in to the fleets uh, from before the treaty period, but there wasn't any such allowance for freshly designed ships. And to a certain extent, cruisers did get a little bit shortchanged on uh, torpedo defense systems compared to battleships, but that was partially because cruisers were supposed to be faster, and when they're faster, the last thing you need is uh, sort of bulges in the hull and that kind of thing, and cruisers being generally smaller and thinner than contemporary battleships. Um, have a limited amount of space, so compared to a battleship, there's a lot less overall volume left for a torpedo defense system, and especially one that wouldn't slow it down, and a cruiser's, uh, one of the cruiser's main functions is to be able to move at high speed, so uh, cruiser levels of torpedo protection were always generally going to be less, and of course the fact the ship just masses a lot less, so there's a limited amount of that you can do. A uh, battleship has a lot more depth and a lot more mass to absorb a hit, and you can work with that, whereas a cruiser, the explosion is physically going to propagate quite far into the ship, regardless of what you've got outside. Um, unless, of course, you do a sort of um, World War One monitor style and give it ridiculous bulges. Likewise with carriers, speed is very important for flight operations. So again, unlike... Uh, a lot of the modernized uh, World War One ships, which were given big bulges to improve their torpedo defenses and um, battleships, which uh, the more modern ones, which could then have full torpedo defense systems designed into them, even if they had to go high 20s of knots instead of low 30s. Again, the carriers would prefer the speed over the torpedo defense. But as carriers were the bigger investment of the two, they did tend to get a lot more torpedo defense uh, installed than your typical cruiser. So, yeah, basically it's just the treaty limits, as we've discussed in some other videos, you've only got so much displacement and you've got to fit on a certain armament. You've got to fit armor that at least makes you uh, not a target for destroyers. And once you've done that, and you've stuck enough engine power in there to get up to sort of 30 knots plus, there isn't that much left in, on a 10,000 ton displacement. Um, so torpedo defense systems did tend to suffer, but that's why you saw things like uh, the Baltimore class uh, and such when they uh, were built without the treaty uh, limit restricting them, their torpedo defense systems at least did improve. Um, Sark Lalaith points out that I said in the Ark Royal video that the spotting range of the eye and increased speed of strike aircraft had an influence on carrier design before radar, but didn't say exactly what that effect was. Can he please trouble me for that information? Of course you can. So basically the short version is 
the various navies through trial experiment and field testing discovered that you could only spot an aircraft so far away from your ship and uh, even with binoculars and such like and when you in factored in the radius from the carrier to its escorts and obviously its escorts would be doing the forward spotting they then came up with a distance and that distance pre-radar was the distance that you could realistically expect to spot an enemy airstrike coming in now obviously the distance from them being spotted to them being over your carrier and dropping bombs or torpedoes would be determined by the speed of the aircraft so if the aircraft's traveling at 200 miles an hour it'll get there in a certain amount of time if it's traveling at 300 miles an hour it'll get there faster 100 miles an hour slow you get the idea and the problem basically came down to that uh, when you've got your fighters on deck they need a certain amount of time to uh, spool up even if you've got them primed ready to go on deck you've got to get them off the ship they've then got to start climbing they have a maximum rate of climb and obviously the incoming strike coming in at a certain altitude so you've got to allow a few minutes well several minutes for the aircraft to climb to a similar altitude or ideally a higher one for attacking and obviously they've got to head in the direction of the enemy and basically what it came down to was that as the speed of strike aircraft increased they could transit from the point of being spotted by the human eye to attack faster than you could launch a fighter and get it up to the altitude where it could actually intercept the enemy and uh, that basically meant that a lot of people concluded that it didn't matter what you did um, if your aircraft carrier was going to be attacked it was going to be hit uh, it was going to be attacked and it was going to be hit because the only thing you'd have to stop incoming aircraft would be whatever anti-aircraft guns you had to hand and obviously in the 1930s that wasn't very many combined with however many fighters you had up there as a combat air patrol if you were lucky and given that was usually two or four aircraft you weren't going to stop a determined air attack with that and to be perfectly honest the mathematics of it all worked out um the british found and confirmed this problem in the mid to late 1930s in multiple fleet exercises and so did the americans with uh, their fleet problem exercises uh, it was purely the fact that radar came about pretty much around the same time that World War One began that uh, negated that whole equation. David Kaminsky says, could you touch on the different types of steel used in ship construction? Um, Harvey, Krupp, STS, etc. When were they implemented and the advantages of one over the other? Well, I do have plans for a special video on naval armour at some point, so I will try and keep it as brief as possible here. Um, so basically, you have, roughly speaking, and obviously there will always be people who disagree and have different classification forms, but to me there's roughly speaking four types of steel used in the construction of a ship. Uh, you have your normal structural steel, which is the bulk of the ship is made of basically so your, your beams and your frames and your hull plating and that kind of stuff um nothing particularly fantastic about it um then you have your slightly improved or slightly to majorly improved structural steel so um stuff like sts steel um which is an american type of steel brought in in their later well, uh, world war ii ships and such uh their later battleships and other construction now uh these kind of steels are tougher but the uh the toughening process for steel obviously makes it more expensive but uh, these are stronger than structural steels. They're not as strong as armor steels, although a lot of people do like to harp on and on about how OSTS counts as armor. No, it freaking well doesn't. Um, sorry, uh, it just irritates me when I hear that. STS was stronger than structural steel, yes, and it was often implemented in thicknesses more comparable with uh, thin armor plate, but it was not armor grade it was close it was closer than structural steel um and certainly if you'd taken it back to i don't know 1905 uh, it might have made decent cruiser armor um 
but it's it, it's a toughened structural steel and that's all there is to it you then have two types of armor steel so you have a type of armor steel which is homogenous so this is just really tough um much much stronger steel than anything you'd uh, build a ship out of and this is used all over the place in various uh, locations on ships um mainly smaller ships although it does show up on larger ships and uh this kind of steel is good at resisting impact and uh impact and explosion you can obviously make it in very thick plates but it's not the uh the strongest but it's also ch much cheaper <laughs> um if you're ordering it in bulk than the final stuff which is your full-on armor steels and your full-on armor steels um at least in the 1900s era are what they call uh, non-homogenous they are face hardened armor steels and this consists of treating a steel in such a way that whilst you're forging it and then cooling it you uh, cool one side a lot faster than the other and this results in the crystalline form of the steel being different so you end up with a very very hard but relatively brittle steel on the one side and a softer but more ductile steel on the other side and the idea is the hard side faces outwards and it should hopefully break up an incoming shell and it has the strongest resistance uh, but if it is overwhelmed by an incoming shell it, and it then breaks if the entire thing was treated to that same level the steel would shatter and you probably have more problems from disintegrating armor plate than you would from the shell um, so the idea of the softer backing is to basically hold the armor plate together as much as possible and minimize the damage caused by the shell coming through uh, that's very basic i mean obviously i'll go through it in um far more detail in the video on naval armor and to cover off the last bit you're talking about things like harvey and krupp in 30 second timeline you have iron then you have compound armor which is steel plate slapped onto an iron plate um, or varying grades of iron depending on who's doing what uh, you then have things like uh, basic steel armor doesn't tend to last very long because it's not that good um, you then have harvey steel which is a nickel steel which is much better and uh, that is then supplanted by krupp steel and that's your uh, face hardened um, relatively modern mix of armor that forms the basis of pretty much all battleship armor from the for the dreadnought era and then within that uh, basic formulation every nation goes off on its own little journey as to exactly what trace elements and uh, what percentage of the thickness of the armor is going to be hardened as opposed to soft and so on and so forth and this along with the material quality of the steel that's actually being used leads to a wide variety in the quality of armor plate by the time you get to world war ii uh, with the japanese ranking quite near the bottom mainly to be honest down to the fact they just don't really have that good quality iron ore deposits in the first place and um, certain types of british plate being the best by a reasonable margin um, although german armor steel is neck and neck with uh, most british armor plate steel uh, in the world war ii era and so on to the Discord questions. MBR14 asks, which superstructures were the most resistant to heavy fire in the World War II period? Well, as superstructures were generally unarmoured, um, no ones really were particularly resistant to heavy fire. Um, in terms of resilience, the, uh, the British uh, tower superstructures were pretty much designed i mean they were they were one of the few superstructure designs that did actually carry a certain degree of armor because as i covered in a previous video about them they were partially designed in response to the fact that no one was ever going to use a conning tower on a british warship so they did make some marginal efforts on keeping these people alive and with their sheer mass they've got more capacity to absorb uh incoming shells and uh, not allow the explosion to spread too far out elsewhere 
as compared to some of the thinner stuff. I definitely wouldn't want to be on any kind of pagoda structure, <laughs> Japanese pagoda mast type superstructure when incoming shells are coming in. That's definitely not a thing that is conducive to long-term continued existence. Um, but at the same time, the uh, German and American superstructures were less massive than the British, so there's also technically less of a chance that they would be hit, but if they were hit uh, proportionally, a shell would do more damage to them. Um, so it's kind of a, a swings and roundabouts thing. Um, if you take an American ship or a German ship, there's a statistically slightly smaller chance that a shell will hit your superstructure, um, whereas if you take a British uh, modernized ship or anything with a tower superstructure, there's a slightly higher chance that your superstructure is going to be hit, but when it is hit, uh, it's less likely to spread damage as far. So, yeah, take your pick there. Lord Prometheus asks, how would HMS Rodney fare against a full-strength Bismarck, i.e. no rudder or other damage? Well, of course, it's obligatory to point out that uh, without any damage of any kind, Bismarck could just withdraw from the battle, um, considering it is outgunned. However, it's... It's, it's a little bit of a difficult one to judge because contrary to the sort of pop history, pop culture, and to a certain extent uh, German apologism, although weirdly enough not usually from the Germans, usually from other people, um, Bismarck did actually fight fairly well during the uh, opening part of its engagement against Rodney and King George V. The main problem is there are multiple conflicting accounts of what exactly happened during the battle. You've got after-action reports from the British ships, um, the, ver the various cruisers that were there and the two battleships, and you've got survivors' accounts, and the survivors' accounts differ from each other. Some of the British ships' accounts of what happened differ from each other. So it's a little bit of a sort of a minefield of trying to work out what the heck was happening. Um some survivors claim the crew was shattered and exhausted after all the overnight um, attacks they'd suffered from. Other survivors claim that the crew was demoralised. Some say they weren't demoralised. Others say that the crew were actually quite fresh and eager to fight. Um, looking at the evidence of the fact that Bismarck was able to show some fairly good gunnery in the opening stages of the engagement until she started taking heavy hits, including uh, straddles on HMS Rodney, I tend to go more with the survivors who say that the crew were actually uh, active and ready for a fight because a demoralised, shattered and exhausted crew are not going to get those kind of gunnery results. Simple fact. Um, the flip side to this is that although Bismarck's forward guns were getting a straddle on Rodney at about the same rate that they would get straddles on Hood... Uh, at the Battle of Denmark Strait, Rodney hit them first. Um, it's highly likely that if uh, that salvo hadn't landed, that um, Bismarck could have landed hits on Rodney in maybe the next salvo or the one after that. But the Rodney hit Bismarck before Bismarck could hit Rodney, and uh, that started the process of the dismantling of the German ship by explosives. Um, so... Working off of how Bismarck fought at Denmark Strait, where it didn't go in for any particularly radical manoeuvres, um, partly to obviously stabilise its own gunnery solution, I don't see how you're going to get too much of a different result, um, because Bismarck's going to be sailing in a straight line, albeit slightly faster, Rodney's going to be coming in. Um, trying to close the range to give it maximum time to fight in case uh, Bismarck decides to run away. And it just seems that on the day, despite the Germans showing similar initial levels of accuracy to that they, which they did at Denmark Strait, Rodney's gunnery was just better. Um, and uh, as we've covered in other videos, those initial hits by Rodney basically just took out the uh, Bismarck's ability to fire back by wrecking the fire control system as well as other things. Um, and that would was basically the writing was on the wall at that point. Um... There are some people who raise questions about the Nelson class's armor scheme um, and the shock effect of the 16-inch guns. But broadly speaking, if my opinion at least is that 
in a fight between a, a full strength Bismarck and HMS Rodney, assuming they're sort of coming at, it, at each other vaguely head on, similar to what they actually did uh, at the sinking of the Bismarck, I think the odds have to favour the Rodney. Um, it's got the thicker armour, it's got the heavier guns, it's got more of them, it can bring its entire gunnery to bear um, without exposing too much of its hull, where as composed to um, Bismarck, which obviously has to turn more to expose the rear turrets. Um, and uh, we'll discuss the uh, armour scheme of the Nelson class in their own video, but I think the uh, looking at it more carefully and looking at the various engagement ranges and falls of shell that were possible, um, the shallow belt that people point out is a somewhat overblown issue unless you're fighting at sort of 25,000 yards plus. But anyway... Um, yeah, I think Rodney has definitely has the advantage, but obviously there is, as Hood proved, the outside chance of a golden BB. So, yeah, there you go. Dynamo says, uh, so I know the Russians like to put tank turrets on some of their smaller ships, there's things like river monitors and such, but were they actually effective? And if they were, why didn't other naval powers do that? So, yeah, they, they were relatively effective, um, mostly because when you're talking about uh, river monitor type activity the gun calibers in question are relatively small and obviously a tank turret is pushing the upper end of things as far as gun calibers concerned for ships like that or boats should I say um, and as a result when you get a lot of the the regular kind of incoming fire 20 millimeter 40 millimeter 57 millimeter all this kind of stuff um, that kind of fire might uh, either kill people and damage components on exposed guns. Uh, it might the higher calibers might still punch through on um, ch guns with gun shields, or force the crew to take cover. But that kind of firepower is not going to trouble a, trouble a tank turret in the slightest, and still less fragments and shrapnel. Um, so yes, they were fairly effective in uh, allowing the guns to keep firing against the sort of peer opposition, which was expecting more weight of fire with smaller caliber weaponry. Um, as to why other naval powers didn't do that, lack of need. Uh, the Russian sort of riverine monitors and such were a fairly special case. There really wasn't that much river warfare outside of that theatre of operations and so there just wasn't a need to um, to look at up armouring ships that didn't exist for the other allies. Life Beyond Living asks what caused British Cordite to become so much more volatile than that of other nations? Well, surprisingly enough, the Cordite itself wasn't the problem technically. Um, the British like everyone else, were perfectly aware of the dangers of magazine explosions, and when they chose Cordite for the new explosive, they were very careful about doing a lot of tests to make sure that magazine explosions were not a thing that would happen. Um, and they conducted all sorts of tests. They stacked several dozen metric tons of Cordite in a huge pile at one point and set fire to it. Um, and no, they didn't eliminate half of Portsmouth Island, surprisingly. They just kind of all burned, um, which was rather underwhelming um, for people who'd gathered to watch a spectacular explosion. Um, so the Cordite itself, um, although it was a little bit more energetic than uh, some naval propellants used by other nations, was not the kind of dramatic, world-ending, cataclysmic explosive that uh, you might otherwise think from looking at uh, things like the uh, detonation of the various British warships in uh, the Battle of Jutland and such like. So, at this point, you might be rather pointedly put pointing at the screen and going, uh, uh -huh, excuse me, uh, still massive explosion. Well, I mean, yeah, the storage procedures of any explosive are always a factor in, but it's not just the storage procedures, it's also to do with the, the stability of an explosive, because of course almost everything degrades over time, and whilst some nations' propellants managed, they managed to find propellants that were just naturally quite stable, and others including the Germans for quite a while included stabilizers uh, and inert uh, substances in their explosive productions, what the British would find um, 
to their cost with their early formulations of cordite was that although it was about as safe as anybody else's when it was manufactured a few years later after it'd been sat in storage or sat in a ship's magazines for a while not so much uh, it would chemically degrade and it in and of itself would become less stable and even more helpfully um some of the nitrocellulose which was the base explosive for almost all naval explosives at that time period um, would actually start to crystallize out of the uh, the main cords of explosive into very 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 small dust particles of pure nitrocellulose mixed with iron pyrite and as any chemical engineer or anyone familiar with the science of explosives will tell you extremely tiny dust particles in large amounts can be explosive in and of themselves this is why you can blow up silos with things like grain or flour or chocolate powder um, simply because the surf burnable surface area has dramatically increased and when you're talking about doing that with something as explosive as nitrocellulose and then you've also got little bits of iron pyrite in there to strike sparks if it gets disturbed in any way shape or form yeah, then things are going to go boom at basically the slightest touch. I mean, this is the kind of situation where if you leave it to degrade long enough, you better hope and pray your ship does not have a rat on board, because if a rat gets into your magazine and goes, oh, I'm going to nibble on this O, and there was the forward part of your ship. Never mind. Would have been funny, though, to find out if something like Mutsu or Vanguard was actually sunk by a ship's rat. Um, but there you go. So yeah, that's that's why British uh, cordite, is of the, especially the World War One period, gets that reputation. Um, the first few formulations of cordite, Mark One and MD, had this annoying tendency to degrade into extremely unstable forms, um, and those were the things that exploded. Which, ironically enough, the degradation actually made them less suitable as propellants. Um, later on. Uh, later generations of cordite were a lot more stable in terms of uh, they didn't degrade anywhere near as quickly and as a result that's why you saw suddenly a dramatic fall off in the number of British ships randomly exploding um, obviously Hood being a combat loss not a spontaneous combustion event and finally for this episode Derp Tank asks, were there any naval advances in the US during the 1920s, e.g. technology, ship size, etc.? Um, yes, definitely. I mean, they uh, finally worked the kinks out of the first generation of 16-inch 50 caliber naval guns. Uh, they were working on follow-on designs to the Lexington and South Dakota 1920 designs and, of course, finalizing those designs themselves. So compared to the previous Colorado, those were a big step up. Um, you've got the Omaha-class scout cruisers coming in at the beginning. Uh, they did also spend the 1920s figuring out how not to build a heavy cruiser. Uh, not that the Pensacolas were terrible ships, but they had a number of flaws uh, which would get corrected based on experience with those ships um in the future uh there's a very good reason why they didn't try and go for another um 10 gun four turret layout they also um began to realize that perhaps the lattice masts even the strengthened versions on the colorados weren't such a brilliant idea and designs at least shift began to shift over towards tripod masts which is always a good thing they were also obviously in the latter part of it very happily and busily converting the first two Lexingtons into aircraft carriers uh, and they had the Langley as well to play around with so they were developing aircraft carrier strategy and tactics um, and all the new technologies inherent with that um, so uh, there was that aspect to it and they were also working on not only increasing their ship's gunnery range, but also increasing the accuracy of gunnery at long range, because the US Navy really wanted to be able to fight uh, long-distance uh, gun duels. And I suppose the f final thing, I mean, obviously there's generic stuff, shells, torpedoes, um, armor formulations, that kind of stuff. There's there's a whole laundry list of minor improvements that any Navy may, makes over time. Um, but the other... Uh, if you want to say technological naval advance um, was fixing the problems with the 14 inch guns because 
uh, the 14-inch guns that equipped a lot of the standard class um, ships had significant issues with shell dispersion, which made them horrifically inaccurate at any kind of appreciable range um, in their triple turret configurations. And the US Navy was working hard to fix that. And it was during the 1920s that they finally cracked and then got round to starting to fix it all. Um, so yeah, plenty of naval advances uh, in the US during the 1920s, um, but a lot of them being stuff that people generally don't hear about or take much notice of, um, which is a bit weird because the alternative then would be somehow imagining that they'd made a magical jump from the Colorado to the North Carolina. It's just like that doesn't happen overnight. There has to be a strong body of uh, naval technological advance behind it and it is precisely for that reason why you managed to get something like the North Carolina and then the South Dakota on a roughly 35,000 ton displacement because of this continuous trend of naval improvement and keeping skills up whereas obviously the poor old Reichsmarine in the 1920s was stuck not allowed to do any of this um, hence the slightly overbuilt and uh, overweight for their capacity German designs of 1930s and World War II. And with that, I think we shall wrap up uh, today's Dry Dock. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, leave questions down in the comments below, obviously in the pinned post. And I hope to see you next time.